of this evening we'll take our scriptures reading from Ephesians 4 verse 15 and 16 but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measures of every part, make of increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, if we look at the scripture <coughs> that we chose specifically for this evening, Ephesians 4, verse 15, there Apostle Paul indicates to us that Christ is the head of the body. So within that, we need to understand what he means when he speaks to us in verse 16, where he says, each of us now, we form part of that body of Christ. Now, I'm not here tonight to speak uh, 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 den specific churches, denominations. I'm here to refer to you that each of us has got the responsibility to make sure that that what Christ expects from us, that we do that what is expected of us. You will see that in the book of John 4 verse 16, it is stipulated very clearly that I'm going to read it to you. It says the following that for me and you to be part of the body of Christ, the following must happen. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So what is important here, if we say tonight that we've got a specific relationship with the Lord, for us to get to that, we need to make sure that we do it through Christ. What is important is that we need to have that specific relationship with the Lord. Each and every one of us need that relationship. Now if you ask me the question in terms of relationship, how do I get to that point to have a relationship with the Lord. Then I think always of my family. For me to have a relationship with them, it means that I need to spend time with them. And that is exactly what I'm trying to tell you tonight. Is for me and you to have a relationship with the Lord, we need to spend time with Him. 
He must be part and parcel of our thoughts. He must be part and parcel of everything that we do. Every day, every moment. We must recognize him as our redeemer. We must recognize him as our savior. But I will only be able to do that once I've got a specific relationship. I've been thinking a lot about my relationship with the Lord. And you know what? At no stage, and I'm convinced about it, is the Lord worried about the fact if I am obeying all his laws and all his commands, if I qualify for his grace. No. The Lord asked me and you from the beginning of time that make sure you've got a relationship with me. You know, everything, everything that is created is by God. Me and you, we cannot create. We can, after the creation, we can invent things. I know Prof. Ruan uh, Creer also, he is going to tell us a lot of things tonight uh, uh, about uh, cardiac diseases and things. But God created that heart. So if I understand the Lord and I've got that specific qualities that the, God, that the Lord bestowed in me, I will be able to think like the Lord. And then everything that I will do, I will do it according to his will. And that is what is so important. So what is my message to you tonight? Is that each of us need to make sure that we've got this relationship with the Lord. But within that, I need to make sure that I use the opportunities within Christ to fulfill that that the Lord expects of me. I'm a, I'm a soldier of nature. I usually will ask any questions, but I think there won't be any questions tonight. Okay. So may the Lord bless you abundantly. May the rest of the evening also be a one of success, and uh, specifically in the day and the years that lie ahead, May you also be then blessed, Professor Ruan Kriya. Let us pray. Dear Lord, once again in this evening, we are privileged to be united in your name. Thank you for a special opportunity like this where we can gather together. Thank you, dear Lord, that during the day that you've guided us, that you kept your hand of protection upon us. Please bless us in the day and the days that lay us ahead. And allow that every time and everything, every moment of every day, everything that we do, that we can do it according to your will. Also be with our loved ones, dear Lord. And we ask for you that we can be united in safety. And everything that we did not ask, but, that you, uh, but you know we need, we ask that you will give us to us. And we only ask this in the forgiveness of our sins. For Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Good evening. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm Avi Kotze, the Executive Dean of a Faculty of Health Sciences, and it is my privilege and an honor for me to welcome you this evening at this very special occasion, this inauguration ceremony of Prof. Ruan Career of a Faculty of Health Sciences at the Northwest University. It's also a very special evening. Uh, for the faculty and for myself, because the last one that I did the welcoming was in 2019, and in 2020 everything stands still, and up to now also, so there's quite a long list that is going to, to be done later this year and early next year, while we are busy with the promotion processes for next year already. So, so Ruan, you, you have break the ice in the new kind of normal, that we have, which is now a much smaller type of ceremony, but also much more intimate. And I think it still remains a very enjoyable occasion and something that we are probably, in these times where we are living, looking forward to have such a, a, a type of function where we can interact with each other and where we can have closer interaction that is not only work-related, but that is also more on a friendship basis and on a collegial basis. Uh, a special word of wel welcome to Prof. Linda Duplessis, sitting in front here, um, our Vice Principal of the Northwest University and also the Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, of the Van der Bouwbaar campus and also tasked with uh, strategic planning for the university. She's our main functionary tonight. 
uh, it's really an honor for Linda to have you here and thank you from traveling from Van der Beil Park to Potsjeström and we deeply appreciate your support, loyalty, dedication and friendship to this faculty and its staff members. Thank you for always being there for us. Welcome also to priest Henry Hornby, uh, who has opened the ceremony with scripture reading uh, and prayer and for your words of wisdom and also welcome to his family. As you all know, Raylene is working in the faculty, so, so Henry is part of a health science family. Welcome to you. Um, and then a word of welcome also to other members of the university management committee and senior management committee, which is not in attendance tonight, but who will um, follow the ceremony afterwards with virtual access when it's placed on, on the different platforms. I also welcome the members of the faculty management committee of the faculty of health sciences and some other Northwest University directors. Prof. Grita Hanekom sitting here, our Deputy Dean Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Prof. Karina Mels, Director of the Center of Excellence for Hypertension in Africa, the research team in the Faculty of Health Science. That's the research entity named shortly as HART, where Ruan is uh, working and doing his research. Then Prof. Sanet, and I don't see Prof. Sanet. Where are they? Is Prof. Sanet. Prof. Sanet Brits, who is the school director associated with that research entity. She's the director of the School for Physiology, Nutrition and Consumer Sciences, and where occupational hygiene is also um, part nowadays. Then Prof. Marlene Peters, and I've seen her here. She's the director of the Medical Research Council Extramural Research Unit for Hypertension and Cardiovascular Disease. In the Faculty of Health Sciences, where is Marlene? Marlene, there you are, yeah. So that everyone can see how you look like. And they work very closely with Hart and Ruan, so, so it's, it's work that is always related. Prof. Ruan Lau is here. Yes, there's Prof. Ruan. Prof. Ruan, Research Director in the Focus Area for Human Metabolomics uh, in the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. Welcome, Prof. Ruan. Thank you for also your collaboration with the Faculty of Health Sciences. A special word of welcome uh, to all the staff members of the Center of Excellence for Hypertension in Africa Research Team, HART, as we know them, the center in which Prof. Ruan work and all his colleagues and collaborators, especially Prof. Gona from the University of Massachusetts in the U.S. Eiffel, and I've heard your name so many times. Uh, he's not a he hasn't come tonight, but he's in South Africa. So he will probably then follow the, the proceedings afterwards. In particular, also a word of welcome to all postgraduate students at, uh, which might be present and other staff members of the university. Then uh, a very special word of welcome to the family and nearby family and friends and special guests of Prof. Ruan Krier. His husband, Mr. Peter De Bruyne. Peter, where can I just, there is Peter sitting next to Ruan. His parents, Mr. Leon Creer and Ms. Amanda Creer. Welcome and congratulations with this very proud moment also in your lives. Um, his sister, Ms. Bonita de Kok, and her husband, Ms. Pierre de Kok, they are in the audience, they, they are sitting. His other sister, Ms. Desrai, and if I pronounce the name wrongly, and her husband, Mr. Chris Becker, and they are sitting also there next to them. Welcome his mother and father-in-law, Mr. Peter Brain and Ms. Pietro de Brain, and then also his sister and brother-in-law, Ms. Nadia Geldenhuis and Ms. Willy Geldenhuis, and I see they're sitting in the third row there also. <coughs> and his close friends, Dr. Bianca Peterson and her husband, Mr. Oliver Peterson. I'm sure Ruan will say later a little bit more of a thank you to Bianca who have assisted him with this function. It now gives me great pleasure, colleagues, friends, to introduce you to our special guest of the evening, Prof. Ruan Krier, and I request that he join me in front in order for me to introduce him to you. <coughs> 
Ruan Krier was born on 7 July 1986 in Clarksdorp, Northwest Province, South Africa. He enrolled at the Northwest University in 2005 with majors in physiology and psychology and obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in March 2008. He continued with further studies in physiology and obtained his BEC Honours degree in 2009. His Master of Science degree with distinction also in physiology in 2010 and his doctoral degree in 2012. So he was studying really hard for many years and he <laughs> very dedicated to do it in such a short period of time. During this time he was also appointed as a lecturer in the subject group of physiology in the School of Physiology, Nutrition and Consumer Sciences the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University in November 2011. In 2013, he was elected as a council member of the South African Association of Health Educationalists, SAI, and promoted to senior lecturer. During this time, he also enrolled in a postdoctoral fellowship at the Department of Medical Endocrinology at the Odense University Hospital in Denmark, Denmark where he spent some time from 2013 to 2014. On his return to South Africa, he started developing a proof of concept study, namely the arterial stiffness in offspring study, and I'm not going to use the uh, acronyms, where he was a principal investigator, which was executed in 2015. He was also closely involved in the International Society of Hypertension which is a very influential or the most influential association in the world in terms of hypertension and his involvement as a member of an African Regional Advisory Group and member of a new Investigators Committee. In 2016 he received the Teaching Excellence Award, the TIA, from the Northwest University. So he was lecturing also during all these research activities and he has gotten full out, I remember that very clearly. In the same year, he was also elected the chair of a new investigators committee of the International Society of Hypertension and served on the executive council of this International Society of Hypertension until 2018. And this is an extremely um, achievement to have to be at such a young age uh, on the executive committee of the most important society in the world regarding hypertension. He was promoted to associate professor in 2017 and became a board member of the Southern African Hypertension Society. In the same year, 2017, he initiated the baseline phase of a Swiss collaborative exercise, arterial modulation and nutrition in Youth South Africa study and attracted substantial national research grant funding along with multiple national and international collaborative networks with prestigious universities ranked among the best of the world. In 2018 he established the next generation network of a Southern African Hypertension Society and was ele elected the chair of the Next Generation Committee of the Society. With his growing involvement in pediatric hypertension research, he formed part of several networks and emerging societies such as the International Con Congress on Hypertension in Children and Adolescents. In 2020 to present, he was appointed within the Center of Excellence, the Hypertension in Africa Research Team Art, as the interim DST in our F. Sarki research chair in the early detection and prevention of cardiovascular disease in Africa and he was also promoted to full professor from the 1st of January 2021. In addition he also held several other positions including the founding director of a childhood hypertension consortium in South Africa and he holds fellowship status with the International Society of Hypertension. He further held several professional memberships from the South African Heart Association, which is a member of the American Heart Association, the European Society of Cardiology, the International Society of Hypertension, and the Southern African Hypertension Society. He is an editorial board member 
of reviews in cardiovascular medicine, as well as the guest editor of two research topics for the journal Frontiers in Pediatrics and Frontiers in Cardiovascular Medicine. He has published more than 80 research articles, yes, at age 35, 80 research publications from his pen already. And this was all in international peer-reviewed journals, as we call it in the academia, academic world ISI journals. And he has supervised a total of 40 postgraduate students and postdoctoral fellows. Ruan served for two terms on the Faculty of Health Sciences Research and Innovation Committee, of course we need his expertise there, and currently he also finds time to serve on the Faculty Board and the Senate Committee for Research and Innovation. He has received several honours and awards, as is evident from this small piece that I've read to you now, from the International Society of Hypertension and was also recently awarded the most productive emerging researcher in both the Faculty of Health Sciences and the Northwest University as a whole for his work in 2019. This is really amazing and I don't want everyone to see my CV anymore. <laughs> um, our older guys, you know, <laughs> can just think how it, well, we, we cannot always imagine how it's possible to reach the sites nowadays. Be, uh, maybe our energy levels is just not what it seems to be or need to be at the moment. But it gives me now really great pleasure um, to say to you that you will all agree that this is a truly remarkable academic record and an excellent achievement for such a young person. And with this, um, ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to hand over the academic wear to Prof. Rohan and to invite him to deliver his inaugural lecture with a title under blood pressure. Congratulations from my side, Rohan, and enjoy your presentation. Dear Vice Principal and Deputy Chancellor, Vice Chancellor of the Northwest University, Executive Dean, Faculty of Health Sciences, Deputy Dean, Teaching and Learning of Faculty of Health Sciences, Research Directors, respected fellow professors, colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Dume lang, goeienaand, and good evening. It is my honor to welcome you all to my inaugural lecture. The significance of the title of this inaugural lecture um, should be acknowledged. Under Blood Pressure is a title that resonated to a deeper level than just the concept of high blood pressure. Um, in, in my family, we enjoy music, and I think all of you reading the title Under Pressure think of Queen, right? So this is also one of my dad's favorite bands, and today is also a very special day in our family because it's my dad's birthday. So. so during the, the last two years, uh, 2020, 2021, the world was challenged by SARS-CoV-2 that causes the coronavirus disease. And throughout these strange times, we were all confronted by change uncomfortable new working environments, family hardships, job losses, and the loss of family members, friends, and colleagues. During the hard lockdowns across the world and the national state of panic, it is beautifully phrased in the song Under Pressure, which goes, pressure pushing down on me, press pressing down on you, no man ask for. Under pressure that brings a building down, splits a family in two, puts people on streets. 
In my own family, we experienced job losses and death as did many others, which intensifies the pressure humanity had to endure, especially during the last two years. Under pressure, the song written by the band Queen and David Bowie captures the current state we are all experiencing and that caring about ourselves as part of the lyrics of the song remains extremely important during uncertain and difficult circumstances. The human body always fascinated me, and my work in physiology reflects my interest and respect for the complicated architecture and design of life itself. We are all under pressure, and all the pressure we experience exert harm on our bodies. The only way we can improve our health is to change our way of caring about ourselves, as sung by Freddie Mercury. Uh, these are my disclosures, and all the pictures I have in the slides are of my postgraduate students or postdoctoral fellows who could not attend this evening. So I would like to give acknowledgement to them, and this is according to the Poppy Act, so I did get written permission for using their photographs. So cardiovascular disease is the number one leading cause of death globally. And if we look at the burden of disease by risk factor, we can see at the top that high blood pressure is the top risk factor <coughs> contributing to the burden of disease and the global deaths, deaths related to cardiovascular disease. And if we put this into perspective of the current coronavirus cases, uh, this is what I saw this morning on the Worldometer, is that uh, the number of people affected by the coronavirus is almost the same and now passing the the, um, the number of people affected with hypertension in the year 2017. But if we look at the, uh, the death rate of coronavirus, and not to say that COVID-19 is not um, dangerous, is that if we look at the next slide, 17.9 million people died of cardiovascular disease in the year 2019, in one year whereas the 4.5 million people die, dying of COVID-19 is spanning across two years, which makes cardiovascular disease still one of the most important uh, problems globally. 85% of these deaths were due to a vascular origin, uh, stroke or heart attacks, and 75% of those deaths uh, are from low to middle income countries. So South Africa is a middle income country and we know that in low and middle income countries there are um, several infectious diseases that are also a problem in such countries such as HIV. Um, however in South Africa uh, non-communicable diseases overtook the number of deaths related to HIV um, in 2010 making non-communicable diseases of which cardiovascular disease forms part of the number one concern in our country's public health environment. Now on a vascular level, our work focuses on blood vessels, especially arteries, of which the aorta is the largest of the arteries, their structure and function, and how they impact the heart when arteries become diseased. So to briefly explain blood pressure, the heart works in cycles or phases to circulate blood through the body um, and using the blood vessels as the conduits to all the organs and the tissues in the body. And during the relaxation phase or di diastole, the heart relaxes, whereby blood returns to the heart, gets oxygenated by the lungs, and then enters the left um, ventricle from the left atrium. And as the blood enters the left ventricle, pressure is exerted on the the cardiac wall and while less pressure is observed in the arteries. However, when the blood is, push, uh, the, the, uh, blood is pushed outside of the left ventricle into the uh, aorta, the pressure inside the ventricle is much less and the pressure in the vasculature increases. So this relates to what we see in a blood pressure measurement where we have a higher uh, blood pressure reading during systole and a lower one during diastole on a blood pressure device. Now one of the factors that is key to, to my research focus is arterial stiffness. And 
I want to uh, use an example of a balloon. M many of you have um, had to blow up a balloon in your life at a kiddies party. Uh, and sometimes there's a stubborn balloon and you have to put in a lot of effort to get that balloon to, to blow up. Now, some balloons are very easy to blow up and others are stiff. So those ones that are difficult to blow up is similar to the concept of arterial stiffness. And this figure was developed by my um, uh, PhD uh, candidate, and now Dr. Ashley Craig. Uh, and she has illustrated here that a blood vessel or an artery that is stiff has a much thicker wall and a smaller diameter. And this is because of collagen deposition and the breakdown of elastin that makes our blood vessels compliant. Now let's have a look at what we have reported over the number of years uh, and take you on a journey through my research career and where it all started. Um, this was a review published by our group uh, where we've shown that, uh, and this is shown in many South African studies as well as in studies in the US, where we have uh, a large um, ethnic composition in the population, black and white populations. And we can see um, that this is a 24 hour blood pressure monitoring in a black and a white population. Uh, and this is during a normal working day in South African school teachers. And we can see if we plot the, the blood pressure values, the blood pressures are much higher in the black population compared to the white population. And no, this is not a skin color difference. It's not necessarily a genetic difference. And I'm going to explain that throughout, of the, throughout this talk and also give my personal opinions about this. So the question arises when we see this, these reported blood pressures being higher in the black population compared to the white population, is that is the mortality rate higher in a black population compared to a white population? And this has not been done in South Africa. And research in the US shows that the, the rate, death rate because uh, or due to heart disease was similar. If we look here at 1968, uh, between black and white populations, and then there was a decline in death rates in the white population, but a plateaued effect in the black population. And the reason for this is the reductions in cigarette smoking, hypertension, hyper hyperlipidemia, physical inactivity explained the decrease in death rate in white populations, and not in black individuals because the um, benefit of preventative strategies was not equal before black and white populations. And, uh, and this is very important, especially in the context of South Africa, where there is in, uh, inequality in terms of healthcare provision, the access to healthcare, the access to healthy foods, and programs to prevent hypertension. In, in more data from our work in South Africa, we showed that um, at the same level of blood pressure, here we can see mean arterial pressure plotted between uh, black and white populations. At the same blood pressure levels, there is a difference in renal function between black and white populations. And this we've seen in, in several other studies, and my colleague, Dr. Lebo Khafane Matemane, who's the expert in the kidney in our group, uh, she uh, will hopefully in the near future also be able to talk more about this topic. But the marker urinary albumin creatinine ratio gives us an indication of the albumin or the pr protein excreted in the urine. And if there is too much of that, it tells us there is a, a, a problem in the kidney. And we see this at the same blood pressure level. So uh, a black person and a white person having the same blood pressure values, there's a, a difference in terms of renal function. So why is this the case? And um, I'm also not going to uh, talk too much on this topic because I'm not the expert on the renin-angiotensin system. But if we look at these bubble uh, plots, we can see very smaller bubbles in the black population compared to the white population. And this illustrates a low renin phenotype in the black populations, contributing to a very unique situation in terms of blood pressure control, sodium handling in the kidneys, and several factors that we are researching in our work. 
on vascular level, this cell here that is uh, in a purple shade is an endothelial cell, a very special cell in the blood vessel with um, extreme uh, properties and you can have a long list of what this cell can do. And my uh, PhD student has focused on the nitric oxide bioavailability and the production of nitric oxide in order to dilate blood vessels that can assist in lowering blood pressure. And <clears throat> she uh, was also very uh, graphically ta talented and she has made all these nice figures, so I thank her for this, uh, because it also makes it interesting for the audience to see. We are ingesting from our food several plant matter uh, that gives us the substrate for producing nitric oxide which is a volatile gas that assists in the dilation of the blood vessel to lower blood pressure. And the endothelial cell um, is reacting on these gases and is also partly excreted in the urine in the form of nitrates and nitrites. Now, what was also recently discovered with our German collaborators is that there's an alternative renal pathway of producing our own nitric oxide in the kidney. Um, and this is an alternative uh, pathway compared to what we ingest uh, in our diet. Now, if we have a lack of nitric oxide, we see several mechanisms happening. I'm not going to explain this in detail, but it um, contributes to the development of plaque formation or atherosclerosis and the process of arterial stiffening, um, as I illustrated earlier, all contributing to the development of hypertension. So the urinary uh, nitric oxide ratio between the nitrates and the nitrites that I just mentioned was a very interesting new concept that we developed with our German collaborators, indicating the nitric oxide bioavailability um, in populations. And this is measured in urine, a very interesting body fluid where, where we can measure several things and Prof. Juan Lowe will be able to tell us many stories about what we can measure in, in urine. So we've illustrated that in the black population, and we can look at the, uh, uh, the black bars compared to the white bars, um, the, the nitrites and the nitric oxide ratio that are lower in the black population may be attributed uh, to some genetic differences in the enzymes involved in the arginine nitric oxide pathway as well as the renal carbonic anhydrase uh, and anion uh, transporters involved in nitrite, nitrite excretion and reabsorption from the primary urine. So the black group also displayed increased plasma and urinary uh, levels of arginine and atma, which are endogenous NOS substrates and inhibitors respectively. So these di differences we see between the black and white populations with regards to nitric oxide profiles of our study seem to be multifactorial and include some genetic components and environmental factors which needs further research to understand the com complex mechanisms involved. Talking about the kidneys and excretion, we know that sodium intake can also increase our blood pressure. That's why reducing salt intake will improve your blood pressure control. And we've also indicated that in young uh, adults, especially in the black population, stiffness, arterial stiffness as measured by pulse wave velocity, which I will mention also a bit later, um, is associated with salt intake in the black population. And this also highlights the uh, importance of looking at the way sodium is handled in the kidney um, in various ethnic groups. When we look at heart level, <coughs> this is a, a depiction of a normal heart and if we take, take a cross section of the heart, we have a, a kind of uh, illustration like this, where we see the left ventricular wall as il indicated by B and the cavity of the left ventricle um, marked by A. So if A is smaller than B, so if this is a very small uh, volume and there's a thick wall, we have an enlarged heart or we call this also diastolic dysfunction. 
some uh, uh, su suggest that diastolic dysfunction is uh, primary to sy systolic dysfunction, but um, in essence, these two develop concurrently, whereas uh, systolic dysfunction is a, a more prolonged process. If the, if the inside of the left ventricle is much larger and the wall is very thin, we have a dilated heart, and this is a depiction of uh, severe systolic dysfunction. Now, some of my early work focused on a cardiac hormone, pro-hormone, called anti-pro-hormone B-type natriuretic peptide, uh, which is a marker of cardiac volume overload that increases under cardiac stress conditions, including heart failure. And we have shown that this marker is higher in black than in white individuals, but mostly because of higher blood pressure, increased adiposity, male sex, and arterial stiffness, as we observed in those populations. We've also indicated that inflammation plays a, a, a good role, or a, an important or prominent role in the development of cardiac overload in these black populations. Now, interestingly, this cardiac overload biomarker also associated with a marker of cardiac fibrosis. And fibrosis is a process of uh, pathological extracellular matrix remodeling, leading to abnormalities in matrix composition and quality, as well as impaired heart muscle function. And we took this a bit further when I did my postdoctoral work in Denmark, and we looked at patients with aortic valve stenosis. And if we take a cross section through the heart here, where the aortic root is, we see this uh, picture where we have the left ventricular outflow tract. And if this area is smaller um, than a, a specific threshold, uh, we can diagnose this as clinical aortic valve stenosis. And interestingly, the biomarker I just mentioned, NT-Pro BNP, a marker of cardiac overload, has a uh, linked very uh, closely with this marker of cardiac fibrosis at baseline one year and four year follow up of these patients. The same with a marker of inflammation, which my colleague um, Dr. Shani um, Leroux is much more familiar with, SUPAR. And what we found was, and this was the interesting part, is that fibulin 1, the marker of cardiac fibrosis, was strongly related to the aortic valve area index that indicates aortic valve stenosis, but not left ventricular mass, which indicates that fibulin 1 is very specific to valve complications and not the left ventricular mass itself. In our work in younger adults, we've looked at masked hypertension. Now, masked hypertension is when you have normal blood pressure at the doctor's office, but when you go home, you have high blood pressure. And we also have something called white coat hypertension when you have anticipation um, at the doctor's office and high blood pressure at the doctor's office, but you have normal blood pressure outside the office. So, masked hypertension and white coat hypertension all are forms of subclinical hypertension all have uh, various um, adverse effects. So we were interested in masked hypertension if you go home and you have high blood pressure and how this relates to left ventricular mass, which is our marker of left ventricular hypertrophy and when the heart muscle increases because of excess uh, cardiac overload. And we've, we've indicated that especially um, individuals with mast hypertension have a 67% increased odds of developing left ventricular, uh, increased left ventricular mass uh, compared to normotensive uh, individuals. Similarly, in mast hypertensive uh, individuals, we saw that salt excretion, uh, which is a marker of salt intake, is also strongly, strongly related to left ventricular mass. And we can also see here that in mast hypertensives, left ventricular mass is higher. And we, we saw that sodium excretion correlated very strongly with, mast, uh, with left ventricular mass in mast hypertensives. Now, when we go to lifestyle risk factors and behavioral risk factors that contribute to this onset and development of hypertension, we can look at uh, physical activity, adiposity, and in this case, we've looked at heart rate variability 
which is a physiological phenomenon of the uh, variation in the time interval between consecutive heartbeats in milliseconds. So a normal healthy heart does not tick evenly like a metronome as I've indicated here, those of you who know music. Um, uh, so it is not a monotonous uh, tone and duration during beats. There should be variation in the length between beats. And uh, a higher heart rate variability uh, shows us that this is a healthy normal heart. So what we have seen here is that in obese individuals that have low physical activity have the lowest heart rate variability. And opposite to that, normal weight individuals with high physical activity levels have the better heart rate variability. We've also worked um, closely with Prof. Ruan Lowe from the Metabolomics Unit and looked at urinary levels of uh, hydro hydroxyproline, glycine and uh, trimethylamine, uh, which inversely associated with left ventricular mass index in black adults only. And <clears throat> these metabolites are important in maintaining healthy collagen turnover and stability in the heart. So this talks very closely to the fibrosis concept that I mentioned earlier. And the data suggested that an increase in collagen biosynthesis and collagen deposition in the left ventricle due to higher central systolic blood pressure in the black population is something we should consider in future work um, as targeted um, areas of research. Now what about the children? And this is where my, my job comes <laughs> into the, the picture. So in the before mentioned work, um, that was my work that I, that I uh, built on and where I started asking myself questions about where does this start? When do we start um, going downhill? And this is actually from pregnancy, when a mum is pregnant with a fetus. And I will explain that a bit um, later. So my research uh, the last seven years focused on children and the questions we have answered so far is what I would like to share with you. Uh, I was invited to write a review paper um, during the hot lockdown, so I had a lot of time to think about this. And um, we have adapted uh, a concept that was published in The Lancet from the um, Hypertension Commission. And um, early vascular aging is a concept that was first introduced by Peter Nielsen in 2008, which refers to premature alterations in artery structure and function and most importantly, even earlier changes in the biomechanical makeup of blood vessels may be compromised during fetal intrauterine development due to maternal nutrition or malnutrition, maternal smoking, maternal health, such as eclampsia, gestational diabetes, access to healthcare, low socioeconomic status, the lack of medical insurance and prematurity or low birth weight. And what we've indicated here is that early vascular aging, as shown in the red uh, line, is individuals that have increased intrauterine risk factors that puts them at the trajectory of developing high blood pressure or uh, target organ damage in much earlier phases of their life compared to people on an average life course trajectory or an ideal life course trajectory where these are the windows of concern or subclinical development of disease. So the trajectory of early vascular disease is where we are starting to focus our research on to identify children and young people with this uh, potential risk of early vascular aging and how to help such individuals. Now, my now colleague and previous PhD student, Dr. Honsi Mukwazi, um, who spent many hours with me in the schools to develop this study, the Arterial Stiffness in Offspring study, and she published her master's paper, uh, which is this one, and indicated that if we um, look at pulse wave velocity as a marker of arterial stiffness, and we compare the black and white children, we see that there is already increased arterial stiffness or pulse wave velocity in the black children compared to the white children. And again, this is not because of uh, a genetic uh, fingerprint or a skin color um, issue. This is typically environment, 
socioeconomic status, access to health care, lifestyle choices, and we will talk about that also a bit uh, later. Now, um, I don't expect you to see um, <laughs> uh, these molecular structures, but um, there are several uh, metabolites that can be measured from urine, as I mentioned earlier. And our German collaborators um, assisted also uh, in this, where we have illustrated that this nitrate to nitrite ratio that I've mentioned before is much higher in the white children compared to the, uh, to the black children. And this indicates that there's a lower nitric oxide bioavailability in the black children compared to the white children. Um, and when we look at the substrates um, available to produce nitric oxide in the body, the substrates were also lower in the black children compared to the white children. And this can be um, explained by the potential uh, dietary differences in these uh, populations. So interestingly, if we plot the, the pediatric values um, of nitric oxide um, bioavailability, uh, against adult uh, um, levels, we see that the black children already at those young ages have almost the same level of nitric oxide available as in adulthood, whereas in the white children there was a much higher level of nitric oxide which gradually decreased and then plateaued in adulthood. And if we look at these uh, graphs, nitrates um, in children, um, and these are uh, boys, um, com compared to adult men, we can see that um, the nitrates is uh, higher in the black boys but lower in the men, but overall lower in the black group compared to the white group, and the same with the ratio. Another metabolomic study um, was the first actually to discover the associations of pulse wave velocity with beta alanine, methylhistidine and alproline in children from South Africa, which suggested potential early compromise in cardiac protective me metabolic pathways in black boys com uh, compared to white boys at, at an age as early as six years of age. These are some of the pictures we have of the um, arterial stiffness in offspring study, where we give each child a ball to encourage physical activity and um, uh, to, to live a healthy lifestyle. We then developed this um, Swiss collaborative study called the Exercise Arterial Modulation and Nutrition in, in Youth South Africa study, uh, which I'm the principal investigator of. And, um, the focus of this study is mostly lifestyle and behavioral risk factors contributing to the development of high blood pressure and increased adiposity in children. We have recently published this paper where we, we've indicated that uh, using uh, US uh, thresholds of normal blood pressure values, because we do not have those kind of normal uh, values for uh, South African children, that 14% of the children were already um, presenting with elevated blood pressure. 21% of the children, and this is a lot, it's one in five children that already have stage one hypertension, according to the guidelines in the US, and 2% of the children with advanced hypertension. When we look at body composition, 4% of the children were already obese, 15% overweight and thinness was found in 4% of the children. And we saw that in an odds ratio analysis that there's a 60% an, an increased odds of developing elevated blood pressure if you have excess adiposity or obesity as a child. Now, the hypoth uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is an important endocrine system that is activated when a person experiences stress. Cortisol is the primary hormone released when the body experiences a stressor, either physically or mentally, and cortisol is also produced in the adrenal gland, uh, which is found um, in the kidney and affects the way glucose is metabolized in the body. Now, my um, most recent postdoctoral fellow, uh, Dr. Sabrina Kuchli, from Switzerland has performed the study and uh, we saw that cortisol reactivity uh, was very low in children that have elevated blood pressure. 
So if there's a low cortisol reactivity, that I indicates some adversity. And we saw that um, in children with high blood pressure and in the black population, especially cardio cortisol reactivity was lower and in the children with low cardiorespiratory fitness, which means children that are less active have a lower cortisol reactivity. We also looked at a marker of proximal tubular function in the kidney uh, called alpha-1 microglobulin, uh, and we observed, especially in children of black ethnicity, that elevated blood pressure relates to this marker. And this highlights the importance of childhood screening for elevated blood pressure to promote primary prevention of hypertension and early onset kidney damage in children. Now, I'm just going to highlight two preliminary studies um, th that we are busy with. Um, and I'm sure doc uh, Pr Professor Wayne Smith at the back will be able to explain this much better um, because this is on the microcirculation in the eye, the retina of the eye. And we look at these specific markers highlighted in yellow. Now, we call it Cray and CRVE, to keep it simple. So Cray is the artery and CRVE is the venule. And when the artery is very small, it indicates a risk for increased uh, hypertension. And also CRVE, if the venule is widening, um, it is also um, an indication of pro-inflammation. Now we see in the, in the black South African children of our cohort that the artery is narrower compared to the white populations of both South Africa and Switzerland, and the, the venial equivalent is uh, much wider compared to the respective uh, white cohorts. Indicating to us that on mi microvascular level, there's also already uh, differences between these ethnic groups, but what, what explains those differences is yet to be determined or to be elaborated on in future research. And interestingly, with the study, we are um, collaborating with uh, Professor Salua Mikrier on food group patterns. Uh, we have um, collected interesting data on children's food, group or food intake of healthy and unhealthy foods, and we saw that uh, salty snacks, cookies and sugary drinks um, adversely relates to a smaller cray or artery equivalent in children, uh, whereas the intake of fruits and vegetables uh, is associated with better artery equivalent in, in these children. So I'm not going to elaborate on the other parts of the microcirculation, but this is to indicate that diet is already playing a huge role in the health of the blood vessels uh, at very young ages. These are some of the, the pictures from our Examine Youth South Africa study, which will commence its four-year follow-up next week. So, yeah, please pray for us. <laughs> now, in the Hypertension in Africa research team, we have done exceptional work with exceptional colleagues. And there are several uh, major projects that have run across many decades in our research unit. And I'm sure some of you will recognize, may, rec will recognize many of these studies. But if we plot it on a timeline of the life course approach that we are currently um, thinking about, we have um, looked at children, adolescents, young adults, school teachers under a lot of stress, uh, a, a wide range of age groups um, in rural and uh, urban areas, and then also the peer study, which is part of a much larger international um, network uh, where we also um, focused on a lot of HIV research. Now what is yet to be done, and this is future work uh, plans, is to also look at the fingerprint in fetal development and the the role of the mother carrying a fetus and the environmental risk factors intrauterine um, that predisposes a fetus of early development of early vascular aging and cardiovascular disease onset. Now, of course, um, <clears throat> we can talk a lot, of this, a lot about the science, but we need to bring the message closer to the community who is affected by these conditions. And over the last couple of years, we have engaged, engaged a lot with the media 
I had some training with Ruda Landman and Janice Lazarus, cutthroat journalists. I don't want to be caught in their, in their studio very soon again. But um, they teach you how to engage with the community and how to bring the science closer to the community that is affected by this global burden. And it's a really difficult a burden, uh, hypertension. It's difficult to control. Uh, we can also look at the awareness rates, which is very low. The control rate is very low of uh, treat me, treating hypertension. But it is our work as scientists to also reach out to communities and bring a message closer to home in an understandable way um, for them to, to really take care and um, take care of their own health. So we are also involved in the World Hypertension Day initiative that is taking uh, place every year, uh, where all my colleagues and I are involved in screening students and staff and help people uh, just realize the importance of a healthy body um, and to optimize your physiological health in order to perform in life and to enjoy life. There's also the May Measurement Month initiative that was established um, a few years ago in 2017 by the um, past president, uh, um, uh, Neil Poulter, from the International Society of Hypertension. And we've published several uh, high impact um, publications um, in the Lancet and in uh, European Heart Journal, where uh, both myself and Professor Angela Widius from WITS have steered the South African uh, component of May Measurement Month, where we've screened several thousands of uh, individuals to make them aware of hypertension and the harms of, of high blood pressure. We've also recently published this call to action, um, especially because globally we have no normal thresholds of pulse wave velocity that actually defines early vascular aging in childhood and adolescence. So there's a um, a huge drive in the childhood and uh, or pediatric environment to also um, make people aware that hypertension is not a disease of the elderly, but it also affects children and infants. So this was the International Congress of Hypertension in Children and Adolescents, of which I'm part of the scientific committee and com organizing committee of several webinars throughout the lockdown, where we also had several um, conferences before COVID-19. And um, this is the first dedicated uh, international conference for hypertension in children and adolescents. There was also this international uh, consortium, the Youth Vascular Consortium, um, that was established that some of us are uh, members of to, to drive the pulse wave velocity normal value um, call to action in this consortium. And uh, very recently, we've established the new Childhood Hypertension Consortium of South Africa, uh, which I founded early in this year, and I decided that it's not acceptable in South Africa to work with US normal values. It's not acceptable to use European cut-off values if we want to define hypertension in a South African child. So why does a pediatric nephrologist or a pediatric cardiologist or a pediatrician have to struggle and find a normal value in a huge chart that the Americans developed, and we can't do that ourselves. So now we have established this amazing consortium of pediatric nephrologists, pediatric cardiologists, pediatricians, biomedical uh, um, uh, biostatisticians, epidemiologists, and a physiologist, and another physiologist at the back. And we have several member institutions that have joined this um, this course, and we have several uh, endorsements from societies and industry. And this, these are my last few slides to make it uh, a bit interesting before we leave. Uh, and this is a superhero that I would like to introduce to you, and his, his name is Captain Hart. So we've developed this superhero to talk to children and to help children understand the importance of health in their bodies. So we've developed this comic book for children and also a video that is going to play in several clinics, pediatric clinics, in schools. And this is to drive awareness in the schools and for parents and teachers to understand the importance of healthy habits and to, to take care of your own body. 
So this Captain Heart superhero is taking the children through a journey through their own bodies in the blood vessels to show them what plaque looks like, to show them what pulse wave velocity is and how they can take care of their own health. We've also developed this brochure for parents to also take note of some hints on how to steer a child into a more healthy lifestyle. So before I finish my presentation, I would like to thank some of the people that are closest to me, including my family and the people who have to endure all the panic and stress going on in the backdrop of this calm presentation. <laughs> Especially my dogs who keep me sane. Uh, I'm a dog person, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. And um, I would also like to thank my exceptional postgraduate students. Without them, none of this work would be possible. Um, I, I'm sure most of my colleagues would also agree with me that the postdoc postdoctoral students uh, or postgraduate students are really important in driving the research. And um, you can see they are very good with what they are doing because they are winning prestigious awards. And then this is a long list of uh, acknowledgements. And unfortunately, I cannot mention everyone by name because then we will sit here for another hour. But I would like to thank each and every one of the exceptional heart members. And this is my colleagues and I can do nothing without them. I don't want to do anything without them because they are the best a center of excellence and really, truly inspiring young people and helping each other. My postdoctoral fellows, my local collaborators, some of them are here, Prof. Salio Mikrier, Prof. Anita Pinar, Prof. Juan Lau, Prof. Marlene Peters, and uh, um, Prof. Andries, I haven't seen him now. No? Okay. And um, several other university uh, collaborators the Childhood Hypertension Consortium of South Africa, very busy people, but they also make time for something they're passionate about. The international collaborators, societies, and funders of we, uh, who we are very dependent on. But most importantly, I would like to thank the administrative support, and this is going to Dr. Bianca Peterson. Uh, this evening would not be possible without her. And the last few months would not have been possible without her to organize the follow-up of the exam and study. She's instrumental in the Hypertension in Africa research team, and she's helping everyone who she can help. Um, and this is really an exceptional individual with a passion for research and data, and she is proud of the work she's doing, and so are we. Thank you. Professor Ruan, um, it's my privilege to congratulate you tonight on behalf of the Northwest University with this really exceptional milestone uh, in your career. And what a privilege to do it with your family present. I don't know what you're going to do for your father's next birthday, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you have a lot up your sleeve. Maybe they came here just to see you because it really does not sound like you have a lot of spare time. But um, really congratulations on the work you are doing and I think also on the impact of the work. Um, at the university we um, have taken a stance that we drive impact um, and, and quality more than quantity, but it seems like you really have succeeded in both. Um, when I listened to Prof. Avi uh, introducing you and tonight, I think none of us have any doubt that you can speak with authority in, in your discipline and that, that's really be, befitting for a, a full professor. I do think you have reached this milestone at a very young age of your life. Of course, it comes with benefits. You never again have to apply for academic promotion at the university <laughs> because um, this is the, the highest step. I think your, your further opportunities are now these international networks, your NRF rating, international partnerships, which have already established. Um, also, the fact that you have already won the Teaching Excellence Award says a lot about your, um, your passion for your work. And I think you have ample opportunity to still make a, a huge impact. Um, on the 5th of March in 2020, the first COVID case was reported in South Africa. And I can still recall that on the 24th of December, Antarctica also reported their first 36 cases. And on that day before Christmas, there was an, uh, uh, 
a news clip that COVID has then spread to all seven continents in the world. And I think that has put the focus not on COVID, as you have indicated, but it has really given us this worldwide focus on uh, health and comorbidities. Therefore, you, uh, your work is so um, valuable and can make such a difference in this time. Um, as I said also last week of the inaugural lecture, with being a professor come other responsibilities, uh, being a role model, being a mentor, but being a leader in your discipline. And um, you are now part of the 12.9% of the staff members at the Northwest University with a full professorship. And we really wish you all of the best with your career. Um, we hope that you will stay at the Northwest University for the years to come and that we can still witness your research and the impact you make in this field. All of the best, congratulations.